day one, we are in the Toronto airport. I forgot my jacket in the car. So this trip already cost me 40 bucks. But I got a, a, a Canada hoodie. And we're going to celebrate the uh, Holland celebrating Canadians. So I guess that's a good thing. I want everybody to know I'm Canadian. Uh, Hannah and I made it through security in record time. So we've got an overnight flight, eight hours, and we will be in Amsterdam tomorrow morning. Hopefully. I know I promised Hannah culture, but we haven't left Canada yet. McDonald's? <laughs> nah, I don't eat at McDonald's ever. I take my kid on a trip around the world, and here she is going to sit here and do homework. This, this is going to be an exciting trip for me, I can tell already. You know they don't do uh, math in Amsterdam, eh, Hannah? I know I just said we never eat at McDonald's, but... And then I thought of Pulp Fiction, Hannah. Oh. Royale with cheese. We gotta go! We're going to Amsterdam, you gotta have the Royale with cheese. No. She's telling me not everything needs to be filmed. She doesn't know me at all. It's like you don't eat... It's like you're not even my kid. I got us the beef shawarma. It has onions. We're sharing. What do you think about getting a Dutch tattoo? Just flows off the tongue. Thank you for Then who wouldn't keep your distance? Great grandma was German. I hear a lot of German in this language. We've just checked into the room and uh, I wanted to show you guys the view. So uh, I guess they're just uh, typical European rooms. This is two singles. My daughter was impressed. And uh, yeah, so that's the, that's the size of the room, that's the whole room, but we're not here for the room. So, I'm going to get out the, the film camera, take some beautiful pictures, let's get this trip started.
got a little Dutch quiz for you guys. We have returned from today's trip, which was the Battle of Arnheim, A Bridge Too Far. If you've seen the movie with Sean Connery, that's what we covered today. It was an all-day field trip, uh, multiple stops, like five stops along the way, including a really cool war cemetery. But uh, we stopped at a grocery store along the way, and I want to show you guys a little quiz here, okay? In the Dutch uh, little country store, what do you think was more expensive? Six beer, uh, and by the way, these are 6.8% beer. I'm used to the light stuff, right? Canadian. Um, I'm a lightweight. Our beer is like 4%, 5%. Or a kilogram of Dutch M&Ms, which tastes just like normal M&Ms. Okay, uh, take your guess as to which one was more expensive and what the price was. I'll let you know at the end of the video. Day two, Zutphen, 7 a.m. here, 1 a.m. my time. And uh, Hannah and I went to bed last night at six o'clock our time and we slept. This is how exhausting it was to get here. Today is the day the tour actually starts. So yesterday we did a little walk around town. We had a little greeting from the uh, mayor's office and a ceremony, thanking the Canadians for what they've done in the past and an introduction to the city. And today we go out and we see our first uh, battle sites, etc. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, no, the uh, view from the window has not changed this morning. So just to let you guys know as well, this is going to become a new format for the whatever videos follow, it's going to be an idiot abroad kind of thing because my daughter says she does not want to be in the video. So we will respect that. Moving forward, I will be traveling alone. American divisions, yeah. 101st <laughs> Airborne Division, Maxwell Taylor, Jim Gavin, both generals, and then Roy Urquhart up here. So one, two, three airborne divisions, 64 miles behind the Allied front lines, right down here on the Belgian border. So here's where it starts out at Belkins Ward, mm -hmm. and they're going to push up this highway to Arnhem. Problem is, there are seven bridges that mm -hmm. have to be captured. On day one, 30 Corps with four or 500 tanks all lined up, all right? maybe about 25,000 troops, 30,000 troops, armored vehicles, all kinds of things, bridging equipment. Mm -hmm. The start is at two o'clock in the afternoon. After they see the uh, airborne coming through from England, 3,500 aircraft of all types, mm -hmm. dropping the airborne in those locations, all three of these locations. Two o'clock, they start their advance to hopefully meet up with these guys. In Eindhoven, the 30 Corps stops because the 101st Airborne is at a place called Saan, just up here, mm -hmm. and the Germans have blown the first bridge. 18 hour wait right there. Remember, these guys, this is the prize, Arnhem up here. These guys can last two to three days. Mm. Two days probably, stretch it to three days, okay? Maybe. Not eight days. It's just one of many uh, Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemeteries maintained by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission that all Commonwealth nations are a part of and they all contribute uh, a certain percentage of their uh, defense spending to the commission and the commission then maintains these cemeteries throughout the world as far away as well Hong Kong to um, um, actually uh, close to Canada as, uh, even in Burma. As, as, as Britain. What's that? Burma. Even in Burma. Oh, Burma. All, all over the place, yeah. Um, and some of the cemeteries are very, very small. So they could, sometimes we only uh, have five or six graves in them, okay? especially the airmen uh, cemeteries. Uh, it, the airmen graves. <clears throat> That's a communal cemetery right across from us. And very often if uh, uh, a, uh, an air crew went down in an area that the uh, population would gather up the remains, like the civilian population, and bury it in the most uh, convenient or nearby churchyard. And then after the war, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, which had been formed after the First World War, would contact the families and say, we found the remains of your loved one or whatever, they were buried 
with four other crew members of their particular bomber or, or fighter aircraft that they were in and uh, buried at this churchyard. Do you want them exhumed and moved to a collection cemetery? And they'd say, very often, 90% of the time, they'd say, no, leave them where they are with their, with their comrades. So they would erect one of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission green signs that you saw coming in here and say, Commonwealth War Graves on it. So you know there's graves in there and they're all the particular uh, style and shape and inscription. Um, this is known as a collection cemetery because after the battle, uh, the eight or nine days of, sorry, the eight days of fighting in this area, um, soldiers were being buried by their comrades um, where they fell. Whenever they had time, they see a body, dig a shallow grave, bury it over, put a stick in the ground. Maybe they'd get a name or whatever, but they'd be buried with their insignia, their dog tag, stuff like that on it. And then right after the battle, the Germans um, exhumed the graves, uh, many of them, and moved them to a different location. And then after the end of the war, the, the following year, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission came in and contacted, you know, made it known to everybody in the area, do you have an unmarked grave on your property when the civilians moved back into their town? And this happened everywhere. And they'd say, it looks like there's disturbed soil in our backyard or our garden or a depression. And the War Graves Commission would come in and they would unearth the remains of whomever was there. Sometimes it was German, sometimes it was British. Uh, um, on occasion around here, there a, and there was a couple of Canadians as well down by the river. So they would identify them and move them all to an established, what was called a collection cemetery. So all those graves would come in and they kept coming in over the next couple of years as people started finding the remains on their property. And they would move them here, but initially there were wooden crosses just like this and they were maintained by the commission until they could get around to putting uh, the granite headstones that you'll see in the cemetery as they are with all Commonwealth war graves throughout the world and um, that took approximately 20 years to do and after about another 20 years they all had to be resurfaced again so when you go when you travel throughout the battlefields of the first world war or even the second world war you'll see sometimes headstones missing from plots. They've been taken away and they're constantly being resurfaced and uh, re, uh, retooled to, to reflect the name in that. Some of the off the beaten path cemeteries don't get the attention that they deserve, but nevertheless their gardens and their plants are meticulously maintained and the groundskeepers are all hired from the local area here. And if you know anything, such you've seen anything about the Dutch so far, they know how to maintain a garden. Right? flying over here towing gliders they don't know where they're headed all right but they're headed just over there and they're cutting them loose and uh, he says something something must be something must be important here all right they're, they're coming for something all right and he said what's important and he stands up and all of his files and his documents all the sensitive material is here for army group B says I'm important all right? <laughs> he's so arrogant they think they're coming for him. No, they're coming for the bridge. All right. So he buggers off this way. All right. And he occupies another place over here called the Tafelberg Hotel. And it's just down the street from where we're going to eat. And it looks exactly the same as it did in 1944. So he gets into that, that area. Within the day, he realizes that the airborne have taken over this. All right. They go, oh boy. I mean, their food is still hot in here. Their drinks are still on the table. And the airborne arrive here. And this becomes their divisional headquarters. So they can start the sending, sending their battalions out in this direction. Three different battalions are headed out to the bridge. They're not going to make it, except for one little battalion. Right? Lots of mortars going off, artillery shells, soldiers being buried all around this area right here, just waiting for the queue to get out of here. There's a... Um, a special march that goes on every year where uh, people are involved in going from Hartenstein Hotel up in the woods there right behind it and following the white tape down to the Rhine at night. I think it starts at 6.30 or something at night and they're already laying out the white tape. Okay. So if you're around here I think it's on 
this Saturday or something that they re they allow people to follow the tape down and they tape it all out. And right where the tape ends down there at the end of the field, that's the Rhine River. Okay? It's down a little bit. Sometimes you can see a boat going past and you can see the mass of the river. Okay, so for those of you guessing, we got the Affligan Blonde Ale was five euros for six beer and change. And the party one kilogram bag of Dutch M&Ms, seven euros and change. So yes, the chocolate was in fact more expensive than the beer. I am now going to enjoy one of the beer and I am downloading a Bridge Too Far with Sean Connery, which Hannah has not seen, which will be the perfect ending to the day, and we'll recap all of the things we learned on our trip today. Before we do that, we're going to go out for dinner. Hannah's thankful because we had dinner at the restaurant last, or at the hotel last night, and it was two of her favorite things, uh, leeks and mushroom soup and cod fish. I thought we were in Britain there for a minute. Uh, I better not mention to my wife when we Skype later that I'm in that I enjoyed a Dutch blonde.